So we're going to start off today. Um, Peter Richberg is at Edinburgh, although he's here for the semester as part of the program. And he'll be telling us about uh, parallel forward and percent methods. Thank you very much for the unusually terse introduction. Uh, and uh, well, thanks for. Saying all the wonderful things, yeah, thanks so for. Say, okay, right. sure. So, so y you can see there's some clouds here, clouds out there. So I'm very happy that I can feel it like uh, at home in Edinburgh uh, today. This is probably the first or second day in, in a couple you know, months. It's been like this, so it's very nice. Uh, so, uh, so I'll be talking about parallel coherence methods. So this is how I view these things. You try to get to the top of a hill, you're maximizing or minimizing, and it's just difficult because you get this big data baggage with you. So uh, most of this work is joint work with Martin Takac, who is over there and on the job market at the same time. So there you go. And some of this stuff is also with some other co-authors, such as Olivier Fercoq, uh, uh, Avlin Biral, uh, Nati Srebro, and so on. Uh, so we have some codes, Hydra, ACDC. You'll see these logos around uh, later on. All right, so first of all, if you think California is expensive, so this is my actual, <laughs> it's my actual taxi receipt from Edinburgh. I didn't pay it, okay. <laughs> but it's, okay. All right, so how many of you know what coordinate descent is? Raise your hand. All right. Good. So, so there you go, this big data optimization with coordinate, coordinate descent. So this is what you want to do. So you want to find the minimizer of a function. I'll explain everything in the serial case, no, no, no parallelism right now, uh, in a 2D setting. So you want to get down there. Now, this is what you do if you randomize. So you flip a coin. And then the coin says you should go east or west. Now, of course, you don't want to go uphill. So you go that direction, which is down the hill. Then you go, and somehow you decide on this step size. In the case of a quadratic, you actually exactly minimize the quadratic. If this thing is not quadratic, you maybe minimize some kind of quadratic over approximation of this or something like this, or proximal uh, step, et cetera. So now you go there. Why would you do this? Why would you randomize? Well, there's clearly better direction. You can go that way. But it's just in a huge dimension, it's difficult to find that direction. It may involve the inversion of a matrix or that kind of stuff, or maybe full matrix vector operations. So what you want to do, you want to simplify things, randomize. So things are easy. It's a very silly decision, but very quick. And usually this step will, you know, if you have a matrix, let's say, in a least square setting, AX minus B norm squared, this step will just take as many additions and multiplications if you have non-zeros in a, in a column of a matrix. So if you have a sparse matrix, it's just very easy. Sometimes it's just 0-1. The problem is with it's just four multiplications, four additions. So you can do billions of these steps. So there's the trade-off. You do very, very cheap steps, but you can, you can do many of them. So now I think I click this again. So you go up, right? You again minimize that function. Then you flip the coin again. You go there, and you just, just, just repeat. In, in the 2D setting, it doesn't really make sense, and especially if you have a quadratic, to go in the same direction twice because there'd be no decrease. But in, in more dimensions, and especially if this function is not quadratic, it would make sense. All right, so then you just repeat, and you can see it kind of zigzag to the solution, right? So this is how it works. This is it, right? So it's solved. Now, you can flip these coins in a biased way if you want. But everything I'll be talking about today is this unbiased setting. So equal probabilities. So there's some recent work where, where you can show that if these probabilities are biased in some smart ways, this thing can be actually much faster uh, in theory. And uh, I will not be talking about this. But I'll be talking about paralyzing this thing. Ironic that in your example, it goes the opposite of the previous coin toss, but that's not, that's not the algorithm. So could you repeat? In your example, it goes the opposite coin toss. Of the it was exactly, it was just alternating. So in my example, it was just it's alternating. Exactly. But this is too, no, it's not supposed to be alternating. You just, you just flip it. But in, this, in a 2D setting, it just doesn't make sense to go twice in the same direction. And especially if you have a quadratic. If you have a quadratic, you just minimize in the direction. You go again, there, there's, there's no gain. Yeah. All right. So, so, so in a nutshell, this is what's going on. If you have randomized coordinate descent with uniform probabilities in n dimensions, this is how many iterations this thing would take. And think of these iterations in the sparse setting as something very cheap, maybe just 0, 1 iterations, okay? So it's n times 
some function of epsilon, where this epsilon can be either this, this, or that, depending on whether the problem is easy or hard and, and so on. So you have a strongly convex function, you get linear convergence, or some people call it exponential, whatever you want to call it, log one of epsilon. If you have something smooth or simple non-smooth, such as lasso, so you have just L1 regularized, you get one over epsilon. If something difficult, you would get one over epsilon squared. Right? But now, what I want to say, I don't care about this. I don't care about the rate. It's not that I really don't care, but I want to parallelize this thing. So what I really care about is this n. I want to push this up to huge dimensions, n, and I do not want dependence on n like this. I want something better than that. Okay? So that, that, that's, that's the goal. Now, so this is what you, you would ideally want. So this is what you have in the serial setting. This is what you would want in the parallel setting when you have tau processors, right? So maybe tau is n. If tau is n, is if, if you have as many processors, of course, you don't have as many processors as, as, as there is variables. But if tau is n, then you just divide by tau. It's a kind of ideal linear speed up, okay? Now, one thing I should say is that these coordinates don't have to be really coordinates. These can be blocks of coordinates. So if you think, uh, working with one coordinate at a time is not good enough. You can just partition the variables or the coordinates into blocks and think of these as coordinates. But I'll be talking about coordinates only. Everything transfers directly to that general block setting. So what do we actually get? We get something like this. Right? So we get almost this, but there's this beta around. And this beta can be small or large. And in some settings, you just, it just has to be large. In some settings, it will be small. So sometimes, the, 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 the take home message from this, sometimes parallelization will just not work. Okay? Coordinate descent is, is, is a sequential algorithm. If, if you parallelize it, sometimes it will just not work. So you have to be very careful looking for these examples where it does work. Fortunately, in many big data applications, it does work because there's lots of sparsity. I'll explain that later on. Okay? So, so this is what you would want, something very small. Good. So how not to parallelize coordinate descent? So, so how about the, f the following idea? So you do the same thing as before, but just for all coordinates, right? So you minimize exactly, let's say, the quadratic in one direction, exactly in the other, maybe in a, in a randomly chosen subset of coordinates, maybe in all of them. Depends how many processors you have. Sometimes it's not a good idea to do everything because you may have billions and billions of, of, of coordinates, and it just doesn't make sense to, to have a, such a heavy step. It makes sense to maybe do... 100,000 in one iteration, and then maybe 100,000 again. So that's exactly what coordinates and algorithms were, were devised. Yeah? So I, I, sorry for interrupting, but you haven't said anything about how expensive the objective function is to evaluate. Are, are you assuming that you're going to evaluate the objective function exactly once per step, or, or, or are you assuming that it's so cheap that that's not an important part? Yeah, so the, so, the, so, the, so the question for the online audience is that I didn't say anything about the uh, objective evaluation and how, how cheap or expensive that, that, that was. So the thing is that coordinates and algorithms, you don't really want to uh, evaluate the objective. Okay? In, in a huge dimensional setting, what you want to do, you want to work with partial deri derivatives and you maintain these derivatives. So I will never evaluate the objective at all. And of course, it depends on the function, whether this is difficult or easy. And I'll, 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 I'll talk about it a little bit later on, but largely I would just ignore this question in this talk because I just don't have enough time for that. But in many settings, one iteration would be, think of it, O1 amount of work. Okay? So that's, that's, that's when you would want to apply uh, coordinate descent. All right. So you do more of all of these and add them up. Okay? So here is a carefully constructed simple 2D example. So you have, this is 0, 0, this is 1, 1. Function value is 1 over here. Function value is 1 over there. Okay? It's a very simple function. Here in the middle, you have the optimal set, function value zero. Now you start at the origin, and you say, all right, it'd be good to move in this direction, right? So you move in that direction, you actually solve the problem with co one coordinate, right? But now you, you want to be smarter, so you say, oh, I'll be smarter. I do two at a time, right? And I, now add these up. So this is what happens. So you're not very smart, right? Parallelization doesn't help here at all. Because then you go there, you repeat, oops, and you're back. It's not always good to be back, okay? <laughs> it's not always good to be back. So this, this was a bad example, right? So this doesn't work, parallelization here. 
It's a very simple 2D thing. Now you think, okay, now I know what I should do. Of course, so, so maybe if I want to parallelize, I should actually average, right? Now, now let, let's ignore the fact that actually we just one coordinate you've solved the problem because this is a simple 2D thing, okay? So I'll just average things out. Well, great, but then you look at this example, right? So you have a perfectly separable quadratic, just x1 squared plus x2 squared, right? You do the same thing, you want to get to the middle. Now, this is what you would do with one coordinate, this is what you would do with the other coordinate. Now you average, this is where you go, but you should have added this up, right? If you edit these things up, you would solve them in one step because these are just two completely independent problems. So you can solve one, you can solve the other, add these things up and everything is good. But you don't know. You, you think, okay, averaging is the stuff to do. So you repeat, and you can see it will take a lot of time to get to the middle. Right? So, so now you cannot add things up. Averaging doesn't work, so what should you do? Right? So and so on. So, so let's look at exactly the same example, but with n dimensions. So if you have n dimensions, you start from at the origin, the function value is n at the origin, and after k iterations, you, you can just easily you know, write down this is what happens. So if you want this to be less than or equal to epsilon, then you need this many iterations. And it suddenly depends on n linearly. So it grows with dimension. And if n is huge, this is exactly what you want to avoid. Okay? So this is bad. This is what we really wanted. So this actually means if tau is essentially n here, because you do n things at the same time, you have tau processors, tau coordinates at the same time. So, so these things cancel. So beta is n. It's bad. That's the bad thing. You want, you don't, you, you want beta to be, to be small, not large. Right? So, so the whole talk is about when this beta can be small. So somehow there's something to do with maybe separability. If the problem was separable, beta can be set to 1. You add things up. If it's not, beta would be large. Right? And that's precisely what's going on. And, and there, there, there's some, some deeper truth to that as well. So, so this is the algorithm. In the smooth case, I'm now, for simplicity, you'll see later on how that generalizes a little bit. So you have current iterate, next iterate, you sum all of these updates up, and uh, beta 1, that's the summation, beta n is averaging, and what you want is beta somehow close to 1. Maybe not 1, maybe 0, 0,1 or something like this, but certainly not n. n is bad. So any questions at this point? Okay. So yeah. Why would this beta be the same than in the previous slide? You'll see later on. You'll see later on. So here it's just building the intuition. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's not clear at this point, but you can see that this beta is averaging if, if it's n and it's one if you summation. So at least at least you know that. Okay. All right. So so now the optimization problems we want to look at. So you can apply core in the sand. It turns out to non-convex problems. You can apply them to nonlinear problems and so on. I'll just focus on convex problems because that's, that's the area I work in. And I focus on minimization of a regularized loss. So you have one term, another term. Both are convex. And this can be smooth or non-smooth. And this can be smooth or non-smooth as well, but it's simple. So this is regular, such as L1 and so on and so forth. Right? So, so here, here are some examples for the regularizer. So the analysis works whenever this uh, regularizer is separable in these coordinates or in blocks if you have blocks. So for instance, if it's zero, of course it's separable. Or you can have weighted L1 norm, as in lasso. Right? Or you can have box constraints, as in S SVM dual. You can have weighted L2 norm, and so on. So separable things work well for the, for the theory. Now what about the loss functions? So you can have all kinds of loss functions. There's some examples only. I'll later tell you about the general structure because, of course, you don't want to analyze this. Well, maybe you do. So you don't want to analyze this for this function, then for that function, and so on. So you'd like to have a general theory which works for a class of functions. Of course, the general theory will then be weaker. So if you want to specialize, get something more out of it, then go ahead and, and, and do that and you get better results. But it's good to also have this general understanding. So you can see that some of these things are smooth and some are non-smooth. So L1 is non-smooth, L infinity is non-smooth. This is actually smoothing of a non-smooth function. So these things are smooth. Actually, they have Lipschitz gradient and so on, right? So, so you have all kinds of uh, losses and you can see exponential loss. You can see that actually parallel version 
of a coordinate set applied to this is something like parallel other boost, right? Then you can have linear programming if you do this. Or you could have all kinds of other things. Okay, so now these are the three general models, and I'll be only talking about two of those. And all these functions belong to one of these models, and you can, you can analyze them separately. So one model is the following. Smooth, partially separable functions. So a function is partially separable if it can be written as a sum of functions, each of which depends only on few variables of the decision vector. Right? So you have maybe billion variables, billion coordinates, billion features. It's all the same thing. And the sum of, sum of such functions, each of them depends maybe on 10, 30, 100, 1,000, but not billion. And you get this because you have sparse graphs. You have, you know, the, in big data setting, many times this happens. Every uh, example de depends on only a few features, and you're there, right? Okay. Now, what's, what does smoothness mean? This is just a little generalization or refinement, actually, of the concept of Lipschitz continuity of the gradient. Since coordinate descent methods work by looking in the coordinate directions, you want to have Lipschitz constants for every coordinate direction. And you get finer information, because Lipschitz constant for the gradient of the entire function might be some very large. That's one thing. And the other thing is, it may be just hard to compute. If you have a billion by billion matrix, Lipschitz constant might be some kind of large eigenvalue of the thing. So maybe it's better to work with, with, with these little Lipschitz constants. All right? And you can already feel that if this omega, the degree of partial separability, is a 1, there was the example with a circular region, that means it's separable, that should be fine. The beta should be small. It should be actually 1, right? If this omega is maybe large, beta would be large. That's exactly what, what's going on. So this omega will, find to, will, will tell you what the beta is. If omega is small, beta will be small. If omega is large, beta will be large. And you can see I'm not assuming anything else. This is all I'm assuming. So just smoothness and, and this structure. And you already have some understanding when this thing will work or not. Of course, the results that you get will be weaker than if you specialize results for some special function. So maybe you can replace this omega by something that is smaller than omega, and there'll be maybe some eigenvalue or something like this, but it's already giving you some information. All right, now I will not talk about this today, but there's another recent work where you have non-smooth max type functions. These are functions, those of you who know Nestor of smoothing, this is exactly what Nestor works with. So this is maximum of a bunch of linear functions over some infinite index set. So it, it will be a convex function. It looks like this, right? You have a bunch of linear functions, and you take a maximum of those. These are linear in uh, x. So you have a convex function. But you have this very special representation of the convex function in this kind of subtle form format. And you have some matrix A around and so on. G would be convex function. Q would be convex set. A is some kind of matrix and so on. So here you can define something like the degree of partial separability, even though it's not degree of partial separability, but it's some, kind of, some, some other measure of separability. So is the maximum number of non-zeros in a row of that matrix? And many times in big data applications, this will be much smaller than the number of columns. And if that is the case, beta will be small, coordinates and methods parallelize well. If it's large, they will not parallelize well. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Now, the third one, which I'll talk about, is functions with bounded Hessian. So these were, for instance, considered in the shotgun. This is shotgun. Okay. In the shotgun paper or in the Hydra paper. So these are functions which kind of look like this. You have global quadratic over approximation with a constant Hessian everywhere. It doesn't mean that the original function is twice differentiable. It, ju it just says, you know, this is what's going on. Right? I mean, there's just this, this, this over approximation. All right, so now you can set L to be the diagonal of ATA. And if you do this thing, you essentially make sure that the diagonal is 1. And you take the largest eigenvalue of that matrix. And the point is, if this sigma is small, the sigma will be at least 1. If it's 1, it's, then this stuff is perfectly parallelizable. If it's large, coordinates and methods are not well parallelizable. Right? So all of these quantities, omega, omega, and sigma, they are just they're telling you whether coordinates and methods will be parallelizable or not. Any questions? Okay, good. So yeah. Exactly. 
So that, that, then w what it means is that maybe it doesn't make sense to use more processors. Maybe you should go for look for a different algorithm, or maybe it, it tells you that you know this thing works with fewer processors. All right. So now the general theory. So the general theory you've seen this already before, looks like this. But there is one change here. So this is current thread, new thread, and so on. But now I have this random set S hat. So that, that's, that's the change. So now I'm saying I'm not going to parallelize everything. It doesn't make sense always to, to update all the coordinates in one iteration because then you have something like a gradient algorithm. And coordinates and algorithms can be much, much better than gradient algorithms be precisely because uh, they don't use, they don't, don't update all coordinates. So, so you have this set S hat. And this set S hat can have cardinality one. If it has cardinality one, you have just serial coordinates n. If it's cardinality n, you update everything. And you can choose it as any random subset of the set of coordinates. Okay? So it also what it buys you is that you have this general theory which spans coordinate descent in the serial setting to coordinate descent to the parallel setting. It also makes it possible for you to fine tune the probabilities to these different sets and so on. All right. So now here is a key concept in the analysis of all these algorithms. Uh, so it's the, we call it the expected sample over approximation. So we say that function f admits beta w ESO with respect to uniform sampling S hat. By uniform, I mean the probability that any given coordinate is picked by S hat is equal for all, pro for all coordinates. It's possible to define a different ESO for non-uniform probabilities. I, I will not work with that today. If this inequality holds, Right, so, so let's look at this inequality, this key inequality, which tells you a lot. Why, why does it tell you a lot? Because I didn't tell you how you pick S hat at all right now. I didn't tell you how you do the updates. Well, in the quadratic setting, you know, you just exactly minimize. But it's inequ this inequality will tell you what to do. So now imagine you have picked your favorite S hat, maybe one coordinate with probably one over n or two coordinates with some probability, and, and so on. You just pick your favorite S hat, assign probabilities to subsets of, of the set of coordinates. Now you look at this inequality, and what do you want to do? You want to minimize the right-hand side in H, and that's your update. Now why? Well, you know, look at this. This thing tells you what is the function value at the next iterate, right? If X is your current iterate, this is the function value at the next iterate, right? But the function value of the next iterate is a random variable because you're randomly picking these coordinates. So how do you move, right? So you want to move, the parallel coordinates and method says, you want to move in such a way that you minimize the expected function value at the next iterate, okay? That's what it says. So ideally what you would want to do, you want to minimize the left-hand side in H for given S hat. But that's just intractable. You cannot do it. It's difficult. So instead what you say, you over-approximate this by a quadratic, and then you minimize that. But it buys you three things at the same time. So this was not minimizable, but at the same time, this thing actually is minimizable, but it's also minimizable in parallel because it's separable in H. That's why we call the expected separable over approximation, separable in H, right? Because this quadratic is separable quadratic, it's just diagonal matrix there, right? And moreover, you can just minimize <coughs> for those coordinates that you're going to update. So you don't minimize for all coordinates and throw everything out and keep just what is in S hat, right? So, so it buys you all these things. And that's the algorithm. So you somehow come up with this ESO. Once you have the ESO for the function and S hat, which means you have these parameters beta and W, which, which are actually parameters for your method. Then you minimize this right-hand side, and that's your next iterate. So this is how it's going to look like in this case, right? So if you minimize it, just set the derivative equal to zero with a convex quadratic, this is what you get. So you go in these coordinate uh, directions, you take partial derivatives, step size is one over wi, but they're kind of either averaged or summed up or something like that, right? And these w's will be, as you'll see, maybe these Lipschitz constants li or something else, depends on the model you work with, and this w will be either one or n or something in between depending on whether the function is maybe separable or not, nice or bad, okay? And of course, if you have this non-smooth regularizer, then this thing will look a little bit different. There'll be this proximal term, but let's, you know, shuffle that away. All right. 
So now, here is one convergence result. So if this F S hat satisfies this ESO for beta and W, now I didn't tell you how to compute beta and W. And if you don't know beta and W, you cannot run the method. I'll tell you later on how to compute beta and W. But if you have somehow magically you have computed beta and W, then you immediately have a convergence result. And it tells you that it takes beta times n divided by this, and this is essentially tau, right? Because this is the average number of updates you do in one iteration. I didn't tell you that S head has to pick always a constant number of coordinates. Maybe in one iteration you update 5, in another iteration you update 30, and so on. Maybe what you have is unreliable processors. You, you, you give them work, and only some of them give you updates. So you work with random number of updates at every iteration. This analysis uh, captures that. Okay, so this is exactly what we want, and this is that psi epsilon which we don't care about, okay? And we care about this, we want beta to be small. Then with high probability, probably it was one minus rho, rho is inside logarithm, so it's okay. You have approximately solved your problem, okay? So this is the result. So rho, if rho can be small, it's fine. Epsilon can be small, well, this is kind of maybe difficult. But if you have a, if you have a, Strongly convex setting, then the epsilon is in the logarithm and it's not you know, elsewhere. So it looks like this. Then it's a little bit different because you have these strong convexity constants of this regularizer and the loss, and they can improve things. So in particular, if this is, if this is large, then the effect of bit beta <coughs> will be kind of subdued. Okay? All right, so this is kind of generic theory. Now you have to come up with this beta and w so you can run the algorithm. So any questions at this point? All right, good. So now I'll tell you how to compute this beta and w for, for this model one. The model one was partially separable smooth functions. And then you know exactly what to do. All right, so first of all, I didn't tell you so far about these random sampling. So here's one, the simplest one. That's the one we have worked with in, 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 in the beginning, in the 2D setting. So this is probably the law uniform serial with probably one over n, pick one coordinate. So probably one over n, pick that one, probably one over n, pick that one, and so on. So you do this, right? Serial uniform, one possibility. Another possibility, pick three at a time, or a certain number at a time, uniformly at random. So these three, these three, these three, and so on. But you're not picking with replacements here, right? So you, you, you have to pick three, so as a subset. But you can also, you can also let if you think of these things as processes, you can let each of them decide whether they're picked or not. Then you have something which we call doubly uniform. So that can be also analyzed. So here is doubly uniform. So this is the following thing. So you have, imagine that you decide that you're going to update one coordinate with probability Q1. You're going to update two coordinates with probability Q2. Three coordinates with probability Q3. And you decide on this probability law. So then you flip a coin and say, all right, I'm updating one at this iteration, okay? And then you pick uniformly at random which one you update. Another iteration, you decide you're going to update three with probably Q3. And then you decide, okay, which three, uniformly at random, you pick three, okay? <coughs> then it turns out next coin flip <coughs> tells you you should update two, and then uniformly at random, you pick the two you're going to update. So this we call double uniform because it's uniform in two ways, but you know. Okay, so this is the probability law. And again, you can think of this as, as maybe uh, unreliable processors and so on, which give you answer or not, et cetera. So, okay. With probability Q5, you update everything. Okay, all right. So this is the double uniform. This is the most general sampling. So the idea why, why we came up with this, because this is the most general sampling, which gives you small beta. So th th that's the take home message. So the convergence guarantee will depend on the sampling, not just on the function, right? Because I told you that this ESO depends on the function and the way you randomize. So if you randomize badly, maybe you just screw things up, right? If the function is bad, you know, you get a bad result. But, but you can come up with good samplings which give you good results maybe even for bad functions. And this double uniform one is the most general one we have for which we can tell you that beta is good. So that's why we have it there. Otherwise, just think about this tau uniform, you, you pick the same number of coordinates uh, in one iteration. And this is, the, this is the result. 
which tells you what beta and w should be like. Because this, this was the stuff that I didn't tell you before. So if you have this smooth partially separable function, uh, so this T is Martin over there in the audience. Uh, so you have these Lipschitz constants in each coordinate direction. And this is sum of functions, each of which depends on at most omega coordinates, features, variables. Okay? So that's the setting. Then if you have W uniform sampling, that was the last one, the most general one, then you have this ESO, it's just definition of the ESO, but you now have formulas for beta and W. And these are formulas. This is not something you have to compute. And you just plug it in and you have it. So in particular, these WIs are just these LIs. And in many situations, these LIs come from free. If you have a least squares problem, these L LIs are the squared norms of the columns of the matrix. So you just get that. Yeah, John? No, can't be. The can't be. The sum of the LIs, you can use no, so, well, so, so some yes, but individual ones can't be. So individual ones are smaller than, than the big L. Sure. That's, that, that, that's true. So yes, but the, the, the bound actually depends on the average of the LIs, not on the sum. Okay, so that, that's what's going to be. In, in, in the result, you get average of these LIs, not the sum of these LIs, if you do it with uniform probability. So it's better. Uh, the reason why you get it with average is because, I mean, you, you can just look here and see that you divide by the sum, take the sum in front of it, and you get actually average. Okay. All right. All right. So these are the WIs. What is beta? So let's just analyze this, right? What is beta? It's one plus. So one is the good thing. You don't want the plus thing, right? One would be perfect. That means you are adding things up and everything is great. But not everything is great. So you have something that you have added to this one. What is it? Well, look at this, and for now, think that norm uh, uh, cardinality of S hat is just tau. You always update tau coordinates. In that case, this is tau squared divided by tau, it's just tau. So this is tau minus one. So for instance, if you update just one coordinate at a time, then this is zero, so this plus is not there, and beta is one. That's precisely what we're seeing before, right? So if you have just one coordinate, beta is one. Everything is good. If this tau is n, then this thing cancels out with this, and you have omega minus 1 plus 1, so this is omega. So beta is equal to omega if you use as many processors as you have coordinates. Of course, you never do that unless you have a small problem, but that tells you that beta can be at most omega, which is exactly what you want because there's a degree of partial separability. If that is small, everything is fine. It's small, it's O1, let's say, right? If each example depends on, at most, 10,000 features, omega is 10,000, but not 10 trillion, what is the number of features, right? Something like that. All right. So that's it. Right? So this, 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 this is the result. So. Okay. So now you can see this is there, this is there, and now beta is small. If omega is small, everything is good. Great. So now how does, how does this look like? So you could actually... Uh, plot this, and you can plot what the speed up will be compared to the uh, setting in which you update only one coordinate at a time. Okay, so if you update only one coordinate at a time, you get certain constant in front of the uh, complexity, the com complexity factor. If uh, tau is not one, you get another one. You can take ratio of these things, and this is what the speed up is. So if omega minus 1 divided by n minus 1 is large, that means this thing is not separable. You know, it's not well separable. So this is the bad, uh, bad message, bad, bad kind of uh, region, domain for parallel corners and algorithms. But it turns out uh, big, the magic big data is here where only a uh, uh, few variables uh, matter in each example. That means that you get very good speed up. So if you have 16 processors, the speed up is 16, and then it goes down like this. It goes down like 1 over, one over r. Right? So you really live here 
in much of sparse optimization in, in the big data setting, which means you get almost linear speed up. Okay. Now, these are theoretical curves for this very general setting with partial separability. These curves look much better if you analyze it for a special problem class where you have more information. So if you have information about some eigenvalues, this would be much better. But this gives you the generic bond for everything. Good. Now, this theory looks fine, of course, but how, how tight is this, right? So, so this is theory. Just different way of writing down the speed up. Number of processors, one, ten, hundred, thousand, speed up, ten, hundred. This is thousand coordinates, small dimension. So this omega equals five means it's pretty separable, right? It's pretty separable, omega equals five. At most, five non-zeros in each row of a matrix if you have a least squares problem. This means you get almost, almost linear speed up. If omega is 100, right, which means 10% of these things in each, in each row of your matrix are non-zero, then it makes sense to maybe use 100 processors, but not much more. You don't get any more speed up with that. But this is, this is necessary somehow, because this is what we get with computations, okay? So look at this. This is theory. This is practice. So for the you know, remaining 20 minutes, I'll just keep doing this. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. But uh, all right. So this is theory. This is practice. But this is a cooked up example, which is tight. Okay. So, so it's not that bad. This is an example when you have a least squares problem where in each row of the matrix, you have exactly omega non-zeros, and all of them are equal. In different rows, they may be of different uh, magnitude. It's a very special cooked up example, and then we get exactly what the theory says uh, with respect to the speed up. Of course, in practice, you don't get these bad problems, right? So this thing can be much better. But this theory, in some sense, tight. All right, so now experiment with the 1 billion by 2 billion lasso problem. So optimization with big data for those, I mean, I, I've you know, many of you gave very nice, nice talks on optimization of big data, and you maybe you know, spend a lot of time in the lab coding things up and so on. So if, if this is a little bit of consolation, you get a lot of exercise, extreme exercise by doing this, okay? So it's really uh, climbing what you do. All right, so, so here you have one core, two cores, up to 24 cores. We do it on one node only, billion by two billion matrix, very sparse, omega very small. And you run this, and you're not, you count the number of coordinate updates, essentially, right? <coughs> and you see that after about 35 times billion coordinate updates, 35 billion coordinate updates, all of these algorithms, independent of whether you update the one coordinate at a time or 24 coordinates at a time, all of them solve the problem. And by solve, I mean solve. I mean, this is solved, you know. This is more than 30 degrees of magnitude. So this thing is solved to death. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a, an official you know, optimization term. So 10 to the 20, 10 to the minus 10. In machine learning, you never want to do this, of course. That means that, that you can stop much, 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 much sooner. Okay? All right. So now, of course, if you do 24 at a time, you do that about 24 times faster. And this is what it, what it tells you. In terms of number of iterations, this takes much fewer iterations. Right? If you have 24 at a time. In terms of wall time, it's the same thing as iterations. These iterations are very predictable because they're very light. Right? So this is wall time. So you actually get speed up about 20 if you have 24 processors or 21 or something like this. Okay. Now, <coughs> this is an artificial problem. We have results for real problems as well. This is artificial problem so that we actually know what the solution is exactly. And that's the only way how we can say that we solve it to the to that accuracy. We, we, we cook up the problem using well, duality. Ellipsis, uh, constraint. Were they the same for all the eyes? And the reason I'm asking is because the obvious thing for me would be to pick pro variables with probability proportional. To yes, so this was uniform. Okay, so it's uniform. This was uniform, yeah. So this is artificial problem. This thing scales up to real problems as well, but we wanted to really see whether, whether this works, whether you can solve it to high, high, high accuracy. All right, so now a distributed version of this. And let me, let me check. How, how am I going? doing with time? I'm doing well. All right. So we call this thing Hydra. Uh, and this is how it works. 
So here we come up with different sampling. The sampling is not serial uniform, what I talked about, it's not this tau uniform, uh, tau uniform, tau nice, it's not this double uniform, it's a different one. We call it, let's say, distribute tau nice, okay? So this is what's going on. If you have a number of nodes, and you want to run a parallel coordinates algorithm on this, how will you choose the coordinates? So that's the question. How will you choose the coordinates, right? So let's say you want to use tau nice sampling. You choose, you're going to update 10,000 coordinates or 10 million coordinates in one iteration. Which nodes will be doing the updates? Well, if you say you want to have all those nodes have equal load, then you should, you should make sure that they get some work to do. But if each node is allowed to work on all coordinates, you have to shift a lot of data around. Okay? So instead what you do, you partition the data in such a way that machine one only takes care of these coordinates and no other coordinates. And with those coordinates, you send all the data related to those coordinates to that machine and, and that data will be there. Okay? So data will be distributed in, in, in that fashion. Machine two will own these and so on. So you create, part, you partition the data column-wise, if you have a least squares problem, always think of this least squares. Column-wise, you partition. So it's different from the talk from yesterday. It was done row-wise, this is done column-wise. And, uh, and uh, so think of it this way. Each machine owns a certain number of features and all, all examples, but only keeps the features, uh, only keeps the information for, for those features it owns, okay? All right, and now what do you wanna do? You want each machine independently to pick which coordinates they're going to update at each iteration, okay? So, and this is town nice, right? So, so you update two here, two here, two here, and each machine picks independently. I'm updating these two, and at every iteration they, they pick which two. They can update all, they can update one if you want, whatever you want. But all of them update the same number. So this is town nice, right? So it works like this. So there's no central machine telling these machines what they should pick, they pick it on their own, but the sampling as a set valued mapping is a union of these independent town nice samplings, okay. Right, so now when you have this, you have to come up with this ESO. This ESO will be different, it will lead to different W, different beta, and that's how you run your algorithm, all right? And, and this is what you can say. So if you have this setting, where you have this constant quadratic over approximation, so, so recall L is just the diagonal, and if you, if you make, if you put once on the diagonal of ATA, you get the sigma, small sigma is good. Then if you have S hat with this distributed town nice sampling, because that's how you would run it, and you have C nodes, so these were three nodes, so you have C nodes, each node owns N over C variables, so exactly the same number of variables, coordinates, features, then you get ESO, and these are the parameters. So you have to do some work to calculate these parameters. It turns out these Ws, these weights here, are just the, di the di diagonal elements of ATA, okay? So no work to compute those, it's easy. What is the beta? And this beta is something that looks ugly, right? Before we had something that looked like this, instead of sigma we had omega, and instead of tau we had this ratio of these expectations and so on. But there's this additional term. So, all right, so the sigma is the spectral norm of the data. Think of it that way. And this sigma, sigma hat depends on the partition. And the partitioning can be bad or good. And this is a novel element in this distributed setting. So let's, let's look at this. So this is the beta. This is the spectral norm of the partitioning in some sense. So I'm not telling you the exact definition, but it depends on the data and depends on the partitioning. If partitioning is bad, this is bad, and this term may create a very large beta, which is bad for the algorithm, right? The whole talk is about this beta, we want it to be small, right? Well, beta one, beta two, fortunately, if tau is at least two, which of course, if you have a distributed algorithm, you don't want each node to update one coordinate at a time. You want them to update as many as they could, subject to communication, you know, uh, not being you know, too large, too much, right? Then beta two is at most beta one. So essentially what this says, the second term doesn't matter. At the cost of at most doubling the number of iterations, how you partition doesn't matter. 
So why is this good news? Well, it's good news because then you can partition data in such a way that you, let's say, minimize the communication cost or something like this, and you don't have to worry about the effect on the number of iterations. All right? Okay, so this is what you get. Number of iterations will be something like this. Two times beta one, and this is good because if tau is large, this will be about sigma. If sigma is small, everything is fine. Divided by tau times c. Tau times c is the number of coordinate updates in one iteration of this distributed algorithm. Because you update tau on each one of these c machines. Okay, so this is what you would want. So, are there any questions? Good. So now, uh, I didn't talk about communication, how that is done, and I will not really talk about it, because I don't have the time for this, but essentially this is how you partition the data matrix, column-wise, you can do, uh, you, can, you can have a reduce step if you want, you can have async, what we call asynchronous streamline, where you essentially send these things in a ring, these updates, because they need to do some communication. So we have an asynchronous implementation, so none of this matters. I'll just focus on that plot there. We have an asynchronous implementation of this, where the communication is done in such a way that each node just sends some information to one neighbor, and that's it, and then new iteration happens. Each node sends it to a neighbor in a ring. And then this is what happens in about, this is 1,000 seconds, I don't know, 17 minutes or something like this. In 17 minutes, you solve a problem which, which, has, which is of size 3 terabytes. And by solving, I mean 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power minus 15 or something like that. So this is solved. All right, so, so you, you can stop much, much earlier if, if you want. Right? If, if you have a machine learning application, you would never want to do this. We wanted to make sure you can actually solve a problem. Right? And this is the asynchronous implementation streamline, and this is the reduce all, where actually it's done properly following the theory. So if you properly follow the theory, then you get this blue thing, so it's a little bit worse, but still works. And this was done with 512 uh, uh, MPI processes on 128 Cray machine on, on, on Hector supercomputer that used to be the, the largest supercomputer in the UK, now it's second largest. All right. So this thing works, and this is uh, uh, half a billion coordinates, features, and billion examples. All right, so I'll conclude, and then, then there's some extra time for questions. So coordinates and methods scale very well to big data applications and problems, but you have to be very careful. Should you add up the updates? Should you average them up? You have to look at the function, at the structure of the function, to see whether you should add up the updates, average, or do something in between. You would like to add them up. Uh, and the structure, there's a lot of structures, partial separability, small spectral norm of the data, nestor of separability, that was the two thing on, on the list, which I didn't talk about. And now there's lots of, lots of work on coordinates and algorithms, and many, many of the people in the field are actually here, or are listening to us online. So Shai, Shai Schwartz is here, he's done some amazing work. Uh, and I think Tong Jiang will be speaking tomorrow about accelerated parallel coordinates and algorithm with a different setup. Yuri Nestor worked on this, on this and so on, Zhao Shong, Ling Xiao, et cetera. This is the shotgun paper. Uh, so this is a paper where we work with arbitrary probabilities. And uh, this is the paper for tomorrow, advertisement for it. Thank you very much. Could you, could, could you say it again? I was just swallowing the water, sorry. <laughs> I was just swallowing the water, I, I didn't hear it. Just, just say it again. Could you repeat? I'm sorry, I can't remember what you're saying. He didn't hear what you said either. Okay, we just can't hear each other. I was just drinking water. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that when you're doing the sampling, the things that you're sampling are indices that correspond to in, in some gradient. And my question is, you thought about sampling where instead of sampling uniformly, you sample the portion of the gradient and then change the update. 
Yeah, of course. So all, all I described here was, was uniform, but, but you're completely right. If you want to speed things up, you should do something to, to go away from uniform. And there's several options. I think, I think there's Adagrad, which does something like this, where we try to do exactly what you suggested. Or what you could do, you could, you could sample proportionally to the Lipschitz constants, right? Which is completely okay. The theory goes through. All right. Now, what you then get is, is that the dependence is the, on the average of these Lipschitz constants. Uh, another thing that you could do, you could just sample in such a way that you assign probabilities to each subset in an optimal way so as to minimize the complexity bound. That's another way of doing it. Yet another way of doing this is to say, I don't really know what these Lipschitz constants are in these directions. I will adaptively change them as I go. Because these, these can be still, and, and one, one can do that as well. So there's many ways in which you can go beyond this uh, theory to make this more practical. Another way of doing this, if you have a lasso problem, many, many things become zero very quickly if this uh, L1 uh, regularizer has a large constant in front of it. And you just want to stop updating those things. So you, you, can, you, can, you can, you know, do some engineering, even though it's harder to then analyze such an algorithm. But we do have results in, in one of these papers where you can get in even five times or three, four, five times speed up compared to this, because this is following the theory, if you do some tricks. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so there's two, two answers to that, but I'll first repeat the question. I don't know whether this is being recorded or you cut it. It's being recorded. Okay, excellent. It's probably first talk when there's uh, questions being recorded. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so the question was that if uh, you go beyond n over omega with number of machines, what well, you can still gain because the theory would say that maybe you might not gain something like this, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so first of all, this theory is quite conservative because it tells you, it, it gives you this very general structure for f, partial separability, and it doesn't look inside the function further than that, which means that omega may be a proxy for something which is much smaller than omega, and the true behavior of the algorithm depends on the thing that is much smaller. And that's actually, that's the case as you've seen with these sigmas. These sigmas are some eigenvalues, et cetera, and they can be much smaller than this omega. Omega is just upper bound on these things. So one answer to that would be, would be yes, the true behavior would, be, would, would sometimes behave on something else. But the, the bound is tight, so sometimes it doesn't. Now, if the bound is tight, then you've seen these examples where you just can't win. You, you add these things up and you, and you can't win, but with this analysis, yeah. with this analysis, I do not know whether there is a different way of doing this, so maybe, uh, just completely different way of thinking about paralyzing core in the sand, not in this manner. Uh, I don't know. We have, we, we have no result which would be a law bound to any machine. Well, the maximum number of but here, here, is, here, is, here, is, here, is, here is another answer to your question. Another answer is that actually the speed up is not really capped. The speed up still, I mean, if you increase the number of processors, there's still speed up. It, it, just, it, just, it just slows down to almost a constant, but it's still going up. The function is increasing, or beta divided by tau is decreasing with tau, okay? But it's decreasing ever, ever so slowly. Yeah, you're right. At some point, it's almost, it's almost no speed up. Yeah, so I, now that would be, of course, great. But that, that's, that, that's you know, I don't know. 